the Capita Reform Agenda series. Uh, and first off, I'd like to apologise for the delay. The PM has been in Brunswick switching on the NBN, where I'm confirmed that when it was switched on, lights lit up and it did switch on. Um, my name's Josh Funder. I'm the chairman of Per Capita. And we're delighted to have with us here today uh, the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, to both launch the Reform Agenda series, uh, but also to deliver the first of what we hope will be a series of significant policy discussions on Australia's long-term future. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, great help of CAUSE in hosting this series and uh, in, the, in the launch today. By way of introduction, I wanted to say something about per capita, uh, uh, something about the need for uh, progressive policy in Australia, and then also some background on the Reform Agenda series itself. Uh, per capita is an independent, uh, progressive think tank, and we're dedicated to building a new vision for Australia. And at the core of that vision is the development of transformational ideas and that they can secure the long-term future of Australia. We demand that policies be morally grounded and economically sound. So in short, policies should be the right thing to do and they should work practically. What do we mean by progressive? Per capita seeks to identify the great challenges as well as the great opportunities facing our nation. A large part of our mission is to ask the right questions of our destiny, as well as help generate some of the solutions. Uh, we undertake part of our work uh, using the best available scientific and empirical research to understand the reality of change and not to deny it, to look forward and not back. We believe globalisation, climate change, social exclusion and economic productivity are among the key challenges facing Australia, but by no means the only challenges. Enhancing social inclusion, increasing workforce productivity and participation, equitably addressing climate change, are not only the right things to do, they're the economically smart policies for Australia's long-term future. The progressive response isn't to stumble back to a time in our past when we felt more comfortable, nor is it to protest a single issue in isolation. The progressive response is to form comprehensive policies that can build a better future for all Australians. The per capita reform agenda series aims to identify the long-term challenges and opportunities for Australia. Today we ask you all to leave the 24-hour news cycle, to leave electoral campaigns, to leave gotcha politics at the door. Along the way in this series, we hope to identify some of those transformational ideas that will emerge, that can meet those challenges and that can seize those opportunities. It may be that those ideas will sit on the shelf until their time comes. It may be that they were needed yesterday. We don't presume to know what the answers are, nor do we presume to know whether they'll come from politicians, left or right, academics, journalists, activists. What we do know is that without a range of big ideas for our future, our future will be smaller and meaner. Our future will be better secured with a bottom drawer stacked full of morally grounded and economically sound ideas, big ideas for a big future. In terms of format, the Prime Minister's speech will be followed by a conversation with the Executive Director of Per Capita, David Hetherington. Time permitting, we hope to be able to field additional questions from the audience at the end. So with that, it's a, a, a great pleasure to introduce the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Julia Gillard, to launch the Per Capita Reform Agenda Series and to present her perspective on long-term challenges for Australia. Thank you very much, Josh, for that introduction. Can I also acknowledge Per Capita's board, fellows and friends, as well as CAUSE for hosting us here today. And it's good to be with the per capita circle once again. And here with all of you, I would like to pay a particular tribute to the work of David Hetherington, his thoughtful, progressive leadership, which has driven per capita's growing success for four years now. In 2007, in your post-election memo to a progressive prime minister, you reminded us successful government demands strategic vision policy experimentation, embrace of risk, and most importantly, an articulation of values. And in 2010, you wrote to me, and you said, a successful government delivers a small number of outstanding reforms each term. If you are able to kickstart productivity, unlock hard and soft infrastructure investment, and put a price on carbon, you will have played your part in a proud Australian tradition of progressive reform. Good advice at the time, and a year on from the election, a measure I'm happy to be tested against. 
because we've achieved agreement for a carbon price to cut carbon pollution and build a clean energy economy. Inked a once in a generation reform to health financing, unlocking the quintessential soft infrastructure investment. Past the flood levy to pay for rebuilding the nation's devastated hard infrastructure. And the long-term push to get productivity growth going again is informing every area of reform. From cutting taxes on low-paid workers and improving training and incentive to get into work, integrating enduring labour values and the economy's contemporary needs, through to the structural separation of Telstra, a real white whale which has escaped many reformers' harpoon in the past. And we're doing what needs to be done, a good solution, a regional solution to the difficult problem of people smuggling. So, David, if you're adding a one-year report card to your memo, I'm sure you'll be kind. But the real test for government is not resolving issues on our to-do list or getting good reviews from commentators. I don't seek elegant policy solutions for their own sake. I seek better Australian lives. And I also seek to make enduring changes changes which will command the support of the community as a whole in the years to come. So for policy to make a difference now and for it to endure for the future, it must be grounded in a deep and sympathetic appreciation of the way our people live. That's why the reform agenda for the government I lead is alert to the hope but also the uncertainty felt by many Australians about the course of future events. We know the fundamentals of the Australian economy are strong, very strong. The Treasurer made some similar observations when he spoke at per capita following this year's budget. Growing employment, low inflation, interest rates still well below those when we came to office four years ago. Low public debt, a stable and liquid financial sector, $1.3 trillion under management in our super funds, a strong pipeline of mining investment. And we're in the right heart of the world at the right time. Ours is an advanced and educated economy at the outset of a new Asia-Pacific century, poised for long-term prosperity through trade with the new Asia-Pacific middle class. The long-term story is one of long-term strength, and I believe Australians know this. But we are not immune to the uncertainties and risk in the global outlook. There are patchwork pressures in our own economy. The natural disasters of the summer have cost us more than we anticipated, even in their immediate aftermath. Australians sense these things too and are making adjustments in their own behaviour. After the global financial crisis, there is a new understanding of economic fragility. If we dodged a bullet in the GFC, perhaps it's no surprise that when a car backfires, people duck. As the real economy globalises, so do economic and political sentiment. We can see these similar trends. Indeed, more sharply expressed in the English-speaking world in Southern Europe and elsewhere. And while the fundamentals of the economy remain strong, it's also clear that things aren't the way they were in the 2000s. In the last decade, personal debt rose as people spent more than they earned but enjoyed the lifestyle benefits. We had a long period of rising asset prices and rising superannuation returns. Ten budgets in a row, starting in 2001, cut income tax. In the last term of the former government, revenues were so high and grew so fast that the Commonwealth Treasury had its own group who joked their job was, as the budget was put to bed, to find a way to dump out the cash and keep the surplus down. Well, no more. Decades of reform and a well-managed stimulus did mean no descent into recession. But with that, 
no soft gains in recovery either. You learned about the malaise of the American economy. They understand that our strong dollar is truly a mixed blessing, both a reflection of strength and a cost to many sectors. And from the cabinet table to the kitchen table, fiscal consolidation is the order of the day. This economic story, rich in opportunity, complex in detail, promising for the long term, challenging in the present, is of a piece with Australians' wider experience of our times. Consider our national security. We have a continent for a nation with an enviable diplomatic and military strength in a strong alliance with the strongest democracy. But we recognise the new threats of terrorism, rogue states and cyber attack, while the old threat, nation-state rivalry, never went away. And it's rightly sobering to the national mood when Australians are dying for us in uniform overseas. We had our summer of sorrow as natural disasters here in New Zealand and in Japan transfixed us and left us troubled about how violent and unpredictable our world can be. Yes, these are rich and complex, promising and challenging years. And as for individuals, so for nations. Faced with challenge and change, we can pull the doona over our heads and leave the blinds closed all day. Or we can get up and get our boots on. I know what I'll do. Because we've got a chance now to do something pretty amazing. To take a 150-year mining investment boom and make of it a once-in-150-year opportunity boom offering a good education for every child, a good job for every family, good choices and true security for every older Australian, and also providing more information and choice, creating options for communities, citizens, parents, empowering them to insist on better, to insist on productive change. My child, my school, my skills, my uni, my hospital, helping mortgagees to switch banks, empowering regional communities to direct the various instruments of three levels of government in the one place that they call their own. Consider the way our minerals resource rent tax will fund future savings, funding contributions to 10 million sovereign wealth funds in which 10 million Australians make super investment choices of their own not dumping cash into one big sovereign wealth fund controlled by the eminent and the grey. Or the way we'll cut carbon pollution through a well-designed market, aggregating competitive responses on the energy supply side and price-driven consumer choices. Not a giant taxpayer-funded slush fund to pay polluters to do the right thing. You'll see the same approach over time as we work through new ways to extend the fair go to Australians with disabilities, as we consider the best policies to provide reassurances to people with disability and those who love and care for them. It's right to aspire to be a country where disability services are based on people's needs for those services, not the lottery of what kind of disability they have, how they acquired it, or what postcode they live in. Where parents of children with disability know that their children will be safe, well cared for and happy when they too grow old and they're too old to provide that care themselves. And when Australians with disabilities have good choices in their own hands, taking away the barriers to finding work, to being involved, and active in their communities. I believe seizing opportunity and offering choice lies at the heart of progressive responses to the emerging social reality of having two senior generations. The ageing of our population is a big new change all over the developed world, and I want to discuss it in some length, in some detail today. A cause for uncertainty People see it in their own lives and they know in part what it means for them. 
But at the same time, they wonder, what does it mean for the nation? And it's an issue people can identify with and they do nominate it as a big challenge when asked. Not least because Australia's former Conservative government saw and said that this, the ageing of our society, was a problem. Now, I don't think the burden theory of ageing is right at all, nor do I think we have a problem of too many old people or a solution which lies somewhere in the population policy menu. I see a change, one driven by wonderful good things, by last century's amazing collective achievements, victories over disease and squalor and want, with rising life expectancy for all. People are living longer than ever before. When Australian Labor introduced the age pension, and I won't tell you what the Conservatives said about the age pension in 1909, but I'll give you a hint. It started with an N and it rhymed with go. I'll let the, you work that out yourselves. But when we sought to introduce the age pension and succeeded in doing so, when Australian Labor introduced it, life expectancy was 57 years, lower than the age at which you qualified for the pension at 65. In the century since, life expectancy has gone up 20 years. Now we've heard that so often, it's so familiar to us, we race over the thought. So for a moment, pause and think about it in your own life. 20 more years to live. All the books you can read, the time to teach nieces and nephews to sing or knit, the time to work with wood or to fish with the grandchildren, the extra day to reconcile with your partners or your friends or your parents. Time to see the Bulldogs win another flag. <laughs> years of productive work, years of volunteering and caring, learning and leisure and years with loved ones too. It's an incredible change when you think about it. Longer lives, more older Australians, this will never be a bad thing to me. And as people live longer, we'll have two senior generations. A new group of people are retiring while the already retired are living longer. Over the next 40 years, the over 65 population goes from one in six Australians to one in four. A big change in our lives. But the over 85 population will go from one in 200 Australians to one in 20 almost a new way of living. For now, those two senior generations in practice are the parents of the baby boomers and the boomers themselves. Think of the 90-year-old woman with the 65-year-old son. And that younger senior generation is the healthiest, best resourced and best educated to ever be in this position, to ever stop full-time work. For the first time, there'll be more part pensioners than pensioners by 2030, which tells us both what a significant shift there is to more affluent ageing, but also the limits of that shift. That private wealth will create new choices, while the state will retain a vital role in guaranteeing income and security for all. Not everyone will have a Winnebago or a trip around the world. Many will work hard. Some will share caring responsibilities for frail parents and young grandchildren at the same time. We will not do away with hard times or the long responsibilities of life, but ageing will change. And the baby boomers do bridge a historic change in human life. Their grandparents were born in the 19th century and their grandchildren are born in the 21st. Even 15 years ago, retired Australians had lived through a period defined by depression and by war. Today, people are retiring whose life has been defined by post-war prosperity and the sexual revolution. They're going to want different things not just security, they're going to want choice. They changed what it meant to be young. 
and they changed what it meant to form families and adult relations or want new ways to make decisions for themselves, while no older Australian should be left behind. This goal is implicit in many measures the government has delivered since 2007, lifting the pension rate and lifting super, while lifting the pension age from 65 to 67 between 2017 and 2023, cutting effective tax on older workers who get the pension through the work bonus, broadband for seniors, an amazingly popular grassroots initiative to introduce older Australians to the internet. Almost 100,000 older Australians have used the popular broadband for seniors kiosks. More than a third had never used a computer before and almost half had never used the internet. It's a very good thing. We're also seeking new ideas. Wayne Swan has appointed an advisory panel on economic potential of senior Australians on the use of that economic potential. It's chaired by Everald Compton to push along solutions as well as to sell the benefits of seniors to employers, some of them sceptical. The panel will examine how we can best harness the life experiences and intellectual capital of the older members of our community. We need to look at our older Australians as an asset to be valued rather than as a problem to be solved. Next week, I'll release the Productivity Commission's final report on caring for older Australians. We ask the Commission to make recommendations, not with a view to the next five years, but the next 20, in one of the important areas that arises from two senior generations, caring for Australians as they age. What I want to emphasise as we begin that debate, not just the debate on the Productivity Commission's report, but the debate about the wider implications of our two senior generations, is the values the government will bring to judging proposals. Choice for each older Australian and security for all older Australians. New opportunities while no one is left behind and we'll apply some practical principles to new ideas as well. First, older Australians have earned the right to be able to access the care and support that is appropriate to their needs when they need it. Second, our older Australians deserve greater choice and control over their care arrangements than the system currently gives them. And third, funding arrangements for the age must be fair and they must be sustainable, both for older Australians themselves and for the broader community. I believe we can seize this opportunity of our ageing society, the new reality of the two senior generations, to build choice and security into the lives of every older Australian. I know we can do these things because we've done them before. I think of what Australians did together when we created the age pension in 1909. The very meaning of ageing, what it meant to be older, changed. Changing how people felt about their own future by offering better standards of living, by offering freedom from want. I think of what Australians did together when we created universal superannuation in the 1980s. The very meaning of ageing changed again, changing how people prepared for their future by offering better standards of living again and by offering new choices as well. And I look forward to the things we will do together in coming years to seize the opportunity of the two senior generations, years when what it means to age will change. As a generation retires, which changed everything it touched. We can be sure that what it means to age will never be the same. Yes, we can also be sure that the values we share will be our guide, just as they've been through the great changes of the past. Opportunity for every older Australian. Choice for every older Australian. Security 
for every older Australian and leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, warm thanks for lifting our <coughs> eyes into the far horizon uh, to outline the reality of the change with ageing, to setting out some of the opportunities involved, but to go the extra step and set out the values and principles along which uh, we should address that change and those opportunities. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, well, thank I'm, you very much. I'm just charged oh. with one warning. Which I, I'm charged with being a bad cop here, and I, I, I will keep David honest. We hope to field questions at the end. If those questions are about short-term news issues, we'll take them on notice, but we do hope that we'll get issues and questions that are really long-term and strategic in their focus. And with that, my bad cop role is over. David, <laughs> thank, you, thank, you. thank you, Josh, and thank you, Prime Minister, for joining us in conversation today. Um, in your remarks this morning, you've outlined... Uh, the challenges presented to Australia uh, by an ageing population. And you've asked us to think about those uh, as an opportunity that the country can take advantage of. Uh, more broadly, though, does this necessitate for us uh, a rethink of the welfare state as we know it? Well, certainly, I think we need to rethink uh, welfare, uh, whether or not we're also confronting this challenge of ageing, but there are additional benefits in doing so as we uh, see the two senior generations arise that I've spoken of. Uh, I've been very determined as Prime Minister to uh, bring what I call the benefits and dignity of work to Australians who have been locked out of the labour force. And many of the initiatives you saw in the recent budget were about doing just that, using this time of economic growth and opportunity uh, to bring uh, job opportunities to Australians, whether they be people on the disability support pension people who have been on parenting payment or the long-term unemployed or people at risk of uh, descent into a life of welfare dependency like teenage mums, uh, bring them into the benefits of work with the training and support that goes with that. Now, that would be a good thing to do, the right thing to do, uh, even if there was no demographic issue about ageing. Uh, but it's a particularly meritorious thing to do when we know that we are facing changes in the dependency ratio. So the more Australians we can have uh, working and living productive lives, good thing. That also means the more people that we've got uh, paying tax and obviously uh, sharing what it means to be a country that will offer uh, security and choice to older Australians. How might your government's response to the Productivity Commission reports on disability and aged care begin to implement some of the thinking that you've outlined here this morning? Well, we uh, do have two very important reports and they will shortly be publicly released. One is the uh, Productivity Commission report on ageing I spoke about. Uh, the other is the report on uh, disability and particularly the prospects of an insurance scheme, a national insurance scheme, which would move us beyond the current situation where some people are able uh, with an, an injury to be compensated for that injury because of the circumstances in which it occurs and others who uh, gain their injury in another way or perhaps born with a disability uh, don't get that sort of treatment. So if you think of the two people with catastrophic spinal injuries, one in a transport accident in Victoria, uh, one from falling off a ladder at home, they are in quite different positions at the moment. Uh, so we've got the Productivity Commission work on that to guide what needs to be a national uh, conversation, recognising how profound this change would be uh, and the importance of getting changes right for people with disability. And at the same time, we need to have the national debate about the uh, ageing report. I think there are some themes that tie them together. For me, those themes are about uh, choice and also about making sure that we're leaving no one behind but helping better empower the people in those circumstances uh, to make the choices that they need to find the services and support they need in their lives. In your remarks this morning, you also mentioned uncertainty and alluded to the fact that Australia dodged a bullet uh, during the GFC. Uh, you could argue that the world dodged a bullet last weekend when the Americans agreed to lift their debt ceiling, but ominous clouds still remain on the world um, economic horizon with the European sovereign debt situation. 
how well placed is Australia to withstand um, a potential second financial shock on the scale? We agreed to lift their debt ceiling, but ominous clouds still remain on the world um, economic horizon with the European sovereign debt situation. How well placed is Australia to withstand um, a potential second financial shock on the scale of the GFC? We, we're not immune to the turbulence in the global economy. Uh, that's clear. And I think uh, the, one of the impacts of the global financial crisis has been that even though we dodged a bullet and we didn't see the high rising unemployment of other nations, including the Americans, uh, people did uh, see the impact. They saw it in their superannuation <coughs> returns. They saw it in uh, share market returns. And many Australians, mums and dads, uh, hold shares now. Uh, they also saw it in perceptions about their home loan equity or the equity they have in their home. Uh, we've lived for a long time with this Australian dream that if you buy a house, then it's inevitable that the value just goes up and up and up and you get to realise that equity in your next purchase or for other purposes. I think uh, now people have realised that, um, you know, the future might be one of more modest growth um, or in some parts of the country, obviously, people have thought perhaps uh, home prices, the value of their own home might have gone backwards. Uh, so these things have uh, pressed on, on people's thinking. Uh, but at the same time, we are living in a, a land of tremendous opportunity. Uh, we're in the right part of the world where growth is still occurring, where people have a voracious appetite for the things that we've got to sell, and that appetite will move beyond resources to other things as the Asian middle class grows, they too will want more choices about what they consume, about the services they use, about where they travel to, about how they educate themselves and their children. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for us and we come to this opportunity with great strength in the underlying fundamentals of our economy. Um, low unemployment, low public debt, a strong banking sector, good regulation, and all of the things that that brings. Uh, so I think Australians should, even as the world uh, sees the turbulence uh, that we've seen out of America and out of parts of Europe, Australians should have a sense of confidence and optimism about our economic future. You mentioned that we find ourselves in the right part of the world uh, in economic terms, and, and if there is unrest in, in Europe and North America, we're, we're at the edge of the turbulence. Um, if there were a major economic slowdown in China, we might be in the path of the storm. Do you think at this point we have the, the breadth in our economy across sectors and, and beyond minerals um, to withstand a slowdown in the Chinese economy? Uh, look, I'm, uh, on, on prospects for uh, China, I believe we will continue to experience very strong demand. I mean, people, uh, obviously, commentators do look and uh, there's a very lively debate in our newspapers and beyond about China's growth rates. Uh, but uh, the kind of commentary we're seeing about uh, some potentials for slowing of growth is still a lot of growth. You know, we're talking about uh, uh, adjustments at the top, still a lot of growth. Uh, and in circumstances where China's growth already uh, is uh, demanding effectively everything that we can sell, I mean, their demand is beyond, uh, you know, our capacity to supply. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think, you know, we can look forward to a great deal of continuing strength in demand for resources and a great deal of strength in commodity prices. Uh, but uh, as we see in our economy now, uh, that does mean that there are a, a patchwork of effects and pressures. Sustained high Australian dollar is good for some and bad for others. Uh, the voracious demand of resources for skills and for uh, investment uh, and infrastructure uh, means that, you know, money runs and people run uh, to the growth industry and that creates challenges for other parts of the economy. Uh, I do think that that requires us to be uh, more finely calibrated in our thinking about place, mm -hmm. about regions and about individual industries than it's been traditional for a federal government to be where, uh, you know, the job has been viewed as getting the big macroeconomic indicators right and the rest sort of sorts itself out. Uh, we do need to get the big macroeconomic indicators right, but we also do need to inform government policy with this sense of place and industry. Uh, and you'll see more of uh, that coming from the government over time. 
Uh, I think we've already got that uh, feeding in through some economic development work that's happening in regions and some good, not old-fashioned, cumbersome industry policy interventions, but some good partnership with industry around innovation. Uh, and we need to keep working on that as we see these patchworks in our economy. It's no secret that some of your big reform proposals are contentious and that the debate around them is really? heated <laughs> and, and, and you know, sometimes heavy on rhetoric and light on facts. And I'd like to um, quote back to you something you said towards the end of the last year about um, the public debate and, and the media more broadly. You said, um, when I stand up to do a press conference, someone's tweeting at the back of the room. Uh, while I'm doing the press conference, someone's using me as a backdrop in a stand-up <laughs> interview. Um, on the way back from the press conference, one journalist is interviewing another about what that may or may not have meant. And then two hours later, you get a call, your press secretary gets a call saying, oh, what was the story again? Yeah. Um, can I ask you, <laughs> how hard is it to advance complex policy reforms and policy proposals in that environment? Look, I think... I think it's always been hard to advance complex policy reforms. I think we, uh, uh, we live with this grand mm. nostalgia about uh, the, the political past and there's sometimes <coughs> this uh, sense in the contemporary uh, dialogue that, you know, in the political past, uh, Prime Ministers got up and said, well, we're definitely going to do this and everybody went, sure, OK, and got about doing it. Uh, well, you know, I can remember a fair bit of Australian contemporary political history. I can certainly remember very clearly the days of the Hawke and Keating governments, and that's not my recollection of the big changes. Let me tell you, it's not my recollection uh, of the tariff debate that had uh, the ALP up in flames uh, and traditional Labor constituencies in this country in revolt uh, because they were exactly the people who worked in the industries under pressure textile, clothing, footwear, car manufacturing. Uh, I remember all of that. Uh, I remember the uh, reactions to the Keating engagement with Asia and indeed we saw some of those reactions play out in our contemporary uh, politics of that day and not happily as people would recall. So sustaining big reform drives has always been hard. I think it's uh, particularly uh, there, there are some new particular factors which might make it uh, a bit harder than it's been in the past. Uh, there's the 24-7 uh, restlessness of the political conversation. So it's uh, harder to sustain a deep conversation. And then at the same time, there's a fracturing about where people get their information sources. Uh, so, you know, to, to take an example, in the days of tariff reform, uh, people would have seen the Prime Minister and the Treasurer talk about that on the 6 o'clock news and they could have sat there and one person in the household said, it's a good thing, that's going to change our economy and modernise it. And one person in the household would say, that's a diabolically bad thing because it means Aunt Susie will lose her job. Um, and the debate would happen. Uh, now, because people get their information from so many places, it is possible for people to lock on to uh, streams of information which just consistently serve them up the wrong stuff, um, which is why it is possible in America, so, you know, years after President Obama was elected, for there are Americans to believe that he wasn't born, born in America because they consistently get their facts uh, from a place that tells them that he's not American and so it becomes reinforcing uh, and it's harder to get um, actual <coughs> facts into the conversation. I think we see some evidence of that uh, in some of our big national debates, including particularly the climate change debate. Yeah, politicians of all stripes will tell us that to prosper in the 21st century world, Australia must be a successful knowledge economy. Um, yet for a long time, over the last 15 years or so, um, public spending on, on universities and R&D had fallen as a share of GDP. Now, your government's turned that around somewhat in the last couple of budgets, but how much more work do we have to do there? We've got continuing work to do, but I'm uh, very uh, pleased with not only the impacts of new resources, but of a profound reform agenda. Uh, I think uh, actually the depth of the university reform agenda that we have put in place uh, hasn't been appreciated yet. Uh, and I'm not surprised by that because you put it in place and universities start adjusting and it takes a while for people to see the impacts. Uh, but we've put universities, universities fundamentally on a path to growth. Uh, we've created a demand-driven system. So 
Uh, it's not a question of a capped pool of places and kids lucky enough to get a place out of the cap. Uh, places will follow student demand on a path to growth. And I am takes a while for people to see the impacts. Uh, but we've put universities, universities fundamentally on a path to growth. Uh, we've created a demand-driven system. So uh, it's not a question of a capped pool of places and kids lucky enough to get a place out of the cap. Uh, places will follow student demand on a path to growth. And I am particularly proud of the fact uh, that the incentive money we put in uh, to partner with schools and to generate enrolments from kids from low SES backgrounds, combined with our student income support changes, which were incredibly controversial at the time, uh, are driving uh, changes about who gets to university. When I embarked on those reforms, I was told, um, you know, it can't change the prospect of poor kids getting into university because it all goes wrong for them back in kindy and school. And I acknowledge we've got to get kindy and school right and we've got huge reforms agenda, uh, agendas there. But I said, I think there are some things we can do. Uh, so we've dangled money in front of uh, the smartest people in the nation, the people who work in universities, and we've said, if you can get poor kids into your university, you can have this money. And the smartest people in the nation have worked out how to do it. Uh, so, for example, last time I saw Glenn from the University of Melbourne, he said the, uh, of this year's undergraduate cohort at the University of Melbourne, 25% of them are from low SES backgrounds. Now, people would have told you that wasn't possible. Prestige University, poor kids getting a go. Well, it is possible, and the uni reform agenda is making it possible. So, yes, there's more to do, but uh, big changes are driving um, opportunity in our society. And, you know, I think per capita obviously spends a lot of its time thinking about the uh, big picture challenges for the future. We spend a lot of our time doing it too. Uh, and it seems to me that and the things that I've spoken about today are good examples of the modern social democratic project. Uh, which is about spreading opportunity fairly and also sharing risk fairly. Just before we turn to the audience for, for a few questions, Prime Minister, um, to what extent do governments have a, a moral obligation, a moral responsibility perhaps to limit inequality, even if that comes at the expense of some economic growth? Uh, I think uh, we've certainly uh, got a moral uh, obligation to uh, to make sure people don't get left behind, that there aren't uh, people on the margins of our society with no hope and no prospects. And I think Australians have stepped up to that uh, moral obligation. For example, the dialogue now about offering a, uh, a chance and inclusion to Indigenous Australians is a better dialogue than we've had at any other time in our nation's history. And uh, many uh, business people in this room, including cause, play a great role in that themselves as a part of uh, changing the life prospects of Indigenous Australians. Uh, but I actually think we're in the happy situation where there's a virtual circle here uh, where the right thing from your moral code is actually the right thing from your economic handbook. Um, it's a, a much better economic result for us uh, to have Australians who would have left, led lives of quite despair on welfare in excluded parts of the country in society's mainstream, uh, earning, embraced, making the choices you and I take for granted. Will we buy that pair of shoes? Will we go and have a cup of coffee? Uh, things that uh, many people don't have the wherewithal to make as a lifetime choice now. Uh, so we can change what it is for them to experience uh, being an Australian at the same time as we can improve our economy because of their work ethic. Now, I've got time uh, for uh, two or three questions from the floor. Um, I would ask questioners that you be uh, concise and succinct in your questions and, and offer questions rather than statements. Um, if I could ask Joe Skrinski from Champ Equity, uh, I believe has a question. Thank you, um, Prime Minister. Um, and first of all, to commend you on your first year role, call, role uh, report card, which you uh, are uh, playing on some very. He's writing it. So, uh, just, I hope just, David gives you the right part. Wait till it comes out. I'm actually speaking for the Australian Venture Capital Association in raising this issue, and that is a capital markets issue. We've talked about the fragility of the international capital markets. We also know that Australia 
doesn't create enough capital to satisfy its own capital needs, we have a huge problem of task ahead of us. In the listed uh, capital markets, we don't have a problem, but that's pretty much the fast money that moves in and out. Where we do have a problem is in the unlisted direct investment area, where the money comes from uh, superannuation funds and institutions both in Australia and overseas. We don't have an internationally competitive product to allow the pooling of these monies for the long-term investment in infrastructure, private companies, um, and uh, property. Uh, it's an issue that's gone around in circles with various government departments for many years now, and nobody's been able to really grasp it and solve it. Is this part of your idea of financial sector reform in the future? Look, uh, I can understand that from the point of view of uh, uh, people with uh, a great deal of expertise, uh, people like you, uh, there's the perception that this is, uh, you know, race around government for a long period of time because it's not not a new discussion. I absolutely acknowledge that. I, I think, to be fair, as we've seen uh, the global financial crisis uh, and needed to work through, uh, a, you know, we already had a better regulatory structure and the fact we had a better regulatory structure showed uh, in the days of the global financial crisis, but beyond the global financial crisis, we've needed to return to some regulatory questions. Uh, so that work has been done. Uh, but I can certainly assure you that both uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer Wayne Swan and Assistant Treasurer Bill Shorten are well aware of the issue that you raise uh, and the uh, potential constraints that it does put on uh, capital flows and are uh, uh, you know, do, doing the necessary uh, thinking work in this area. So I don't come with any uh, ready-made solution for you, uh, but I, I can... Uh, you know, tell you that it is a problem, an issue, uh, understood by government. Uh, next, we have a question from Peter Winneke from the Meyer Foundation. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, Prime Minister, despite um, staggering wealth in this country, uh, we have a tiny philanthropic sector. Um, I'm interested in uh, any plans the government has to assist build a cultural giving in this country. Uh, well, I think we've got some things to do on, on uh, you know, the not-for-profit sector that uh, Tanya Plebisek's doing, so better government engagement with the not-for-profit sector. Uh, on the, the question of philanthropy, there are some, uh, you know, regulatory questions, but really I think our role uh, is probably bringing people together uh, and using the, you know, sort of uh, power of advocacy that government can bring uh, to get people to think through uh, philanthropy issues. Uh, I did, uh, uh, during the course of this year, bring a series of people together for a discussion uh, to get a, a sense of the scale and depth of some of the things that are happening in America uh, where some amazing philanth uh, philanthropists uh, basically gift uh, you know, all of their uh, wealth or a large proportion of their wealth whilst they're still alive so that they can see the benefits of that uh, rather than the more traditional model of, uh, you know, the foundation that you gift into as part of your disposition um, at the time of your death. Uh, so I think there are some great models there and there was certainly engagement in the room about it and there are people uh, who have set up now and are able to provide advice about these giving strategies. But uh, for us it's, you know, going to be... Uh, a national uh, discussion where government can play a role, uh, but by its very nature it needs to be a much broader and deeper conversation than that to change uh, the way in which uh, people view uh, their own accumulation of wealth and then the use of it. And uh, last question from the floor from Brendan Dow of Ceramic Fuel Service. Prime Minister, um, I wrote my question down so I wouldn't waffle. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a, this <laughs> that's, is a that's story. Um, because we're a company that actually benefits from a carbon price. There are feeding tariffs in place for rooftop solar in Australia, but they're clearly not sustainable. West Australia announced this week they were shutting theirs down. New South Wales have scaled it back. And I'm told by the Energy Minister in Victoria that we're about to hit our cap. So there's a fuel cell system that ceramic fuel cells designed and built here in Australia, and it's smaller than a dishwasher. We can install it in your home and it can save four times as much carbon and generate six times as much power as a rooftop solar system. There are national feeding tariffs in Germany 
and UK and France and Netherlands for residential scale fuel cells. This is an issue which can't be palmed off to the states, which is typically the response we get. The federal has four times as much carbon and generates six times as much power as the rooftop solar system. There are national feeding tariffs in Germany and UK and France and Netherlands for residential scale fuel cells. This is an issue which can't be palmed off to the states, which is typically the response we get. The federal government is really serious about energy reform. So will the government be looking at creating a national feeding tariff for residential fuel cells and other low emission technologies? Thanks for that question. Uh, we are serious about a clean energy uh, future, which is why, of course, we've uh, pressed on uh, with putting a price on carbon and I continue to uh, move around explaining what that means for Australians and, as David said, it's been a controversial debate and it's going to continue to be a controversial debate as we legislate the scheme we announced um, through the Parliament during the uh, remaining months of this year and it comes into effect on the 1st of July next year. Uh, we've said, you know, that's the sort of important project with the complementary measures that we've announced. Uh, I have received an energy efficiency report which invites government to canvas some broader questions and obviously uh, we'll have the internal discussions on that. Uh, but, you know, our focus will remain on delivering the carbon price package that we've announced. Uh, I believe uh, that, you know, the importance of that is that, that it sends uh, the right market signals in the most efficient way. And I think uh, there is concern that there are schemes uh, in existence that states have gone for that aren't compatible between states, they're not national, and have implied in them a far greater price per tonne for abatement uh, than the carbon pricing scheme that will be in, in place nationally. Uh, so I can't uh, give you the answer you probably want to hear uh, but, uh, you know, we, we're serious about a clean energy future and we believe carbon pricing uh, is the best route to get there. Well, I'll use the privilege of the chair to ask the last question. <laughs> um, Prime Minister, what are the ideas that you're passionate about that aren't currently part of the, the national public debate or aren't sufficiently prominent in that debate? Look, I think uh, that, you know, the uh, great delight of this uh, position is that I, I do get the opportunity to... Uh, inject a lot into our national conversations and shape the things that we're talking about. I believe that there's uh, a lot that uh, the government has done and that we are moving uh, to with the release of the Productivity Commission reports. There's a lot there. Uh, when you, you look across it all, um, you know, whether it's clean energy future, the productivity challenges, the participation challenges, uh, they're about strengthening and modernising our economy. Uh, when you uh, look at the suite of government issues, they're about extending opportunity and we've talked about our university reforms, for example, there and there are many others. Uh, so I think there are uh, many important uh, detailed topics on the agenda. It's really about uh, ensuring that the national debate uh, works its way through them uh, not only on their own merits, but in a way that builds the connections. Uh, I, I certainly don't view my role as injecting an issue out there for debate as a bit of disconnected stuff mm -hmm. uh, from, from a broader project. Uh, the broader project to me is clear. It is about uh, uh, strengthening and modernising our economy so that we can offer uh, shared opportunity for Australians and opportunity in a new way uh, with more personal empowerment and choices than we've had before. We've got a set of individual policy questions that add up to that. And so for people who are passionate about engaging uh, in the public policy debate, I would direct them to that menu that's there now uh, because there's a lot of depth there and a lot of big questions to work through. Well, Julia Gillard, thank you for your insights and reflections this morning. Um, to conclude, uh, I'd like to invite John Denton, Chief Executive of course Chambers Westcar, to come up and offer a vote of thanks. Thanks very much, uh, David, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Prime Minister. Cause is a, a world-class law firm determined to drive Australia's competitiveness and its economic engagement with Asia. And in that context, of course, it makes perfect sense for us to host the Prime Minister today 
as she lays out, again, a reform agenda for this country. And also, it's a great pleasure to work with an organisation such as Per Capita, as we work with major universities and other think tanks, as we seek to drive the debate to ensure that the issues that are most important to Australians around competitiveness are at the forefront. One thing that um, I'd like to, to focus on a little today is that having lifted the, uh, the discussion from the day to day and actually trying to push the discussion out beyond uh, the, uh, over the horizon, it's actually beyond our borders as well. <clears throat> I have the privilege of dealing most recently with the Prime Minister in the context of discussions at the G20 and also at APEC. Um, the reason I raise that is that one thing I don't think the Prime Minister is fully commended for is her direct engagement and understanding and grappling with the most important issues to do is with, to do with uh, global economic engagement and also global security issues. I think it's, uh, it hasn't been focused on enough that as soon as the Prime Minister emerged as the leader of this country, she engaged immediately in trying to understand and grapple with the context in which the G20 is operating. Not enough time and effort is spent in this country in understanding how important it is to actually set the architecture for the future. As the, uh, the, the architecture was set around Bretton Woods, that the outcome of that served, this, served the nation and served the global community very, very well for 40 or 50 years. Such is the intensity that needs to be brought to the discussions at the G20. And can I say that the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister have both done so and will continue to do so. The Prime Minister has also recognised the importance of ensuring that the region in which we operate in, which is the fastest growing region, the APEC region, is properly ambitious in its goals. And she has participated, particularly at last year's leaders' meeting uh, uh, in, in, uh, with, in, in, uh, in the APEC process in Yokohama, in ensuring that the ambition of APEC was raised to the whole concept of regional economic integration. I don't think people realise yet how important that ambition will be for setting the architecture for this region as well. The other area on, on global security, the Prime Minister has pushed, and we will now see towards the end of this year, a reconstituted uh, East Asia summit will bring in for the first time America and a couple of other critical players. But the reason that is so important, because we're going to talk about economic growth, we need to ensure that there's security stability as well. And the Prime Minister is rightly engaged in that, and actually we're rightly delivering that as an outcome for, for the global community, but also for Australia. The Prime Minister mentioned China. And earlier this year, the, China, uh, the Prime Minister made a timely and I think important visit to China. But one of the big issues that emerges from our understanding and engagement with China is that I don't think we as a nation have yet grappled with the opportunities and implications of the dramatic rise in economic power and authority of China. I'd actually ask the Prime Minister to consider actually conducting and overseeing the creation of a white paper which will actually deal with that. And I think that white paper, if, if I may, should be led by Prime Minister and Cabinet because it's not a foreign policy issue. This may well lead to some important uh, thinking around structural implications for the Australian economy so that we can grapple with and actually take advantage of the opportunities as they emerge. So I commend that as a thought to the Prime Minister. I can also note that towards the end of this year, the Prime Minister will assume the chair of uh, the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting will be the most important diplomatic meeting to take place in the Southern Hemisphere this year. The Prime Minister will emerge as the leader of that. And can I can also ask her to think very seriously about how we can reform the Commonwealth to ensure that it continues to make sense. The Commonwealth makes sense in two areas. Business to business relations, because it links up Australia, for example, with India and with, the Afri with Africa, both very important areas for us, and on people to people, which it does through the Commonwealth Games. Those are the two areas that are most important. If we can work to restructure the Commonwealth to actually ensure that those two areas are front and centre, and if the Prime Minister could lead that, we will end up with a very successful Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Prime Minister, thank you very much for your time today. I commend you for the, uh, the fortitude that you have. And I also always look, try to look at the shoe leather, but there's still some there. So good, good luck. <laughs> good luck. And thank you very much again. And to per capita, thank you. Thank you.